Um, uh, moving on to Poco Rosso. So I saw this movie and I was like, ah, it's a movie about an animal guy. Um, I don't know how much I can, I can say about this until I read the, a translation of the press release for Poco Rosso, which said, this is a movie about a man who cursed himself to be a pig. And in that same press release, Miyazaki is quoted as saying, when a man becomes middle-aged, he becomes a pig. <laughs> which I like. I mean, that, that is funny. Um, but what that means is that, in a sense, this is Porco's natural state. He is supposed to be a pig, right? This is not a curse in the sense that he doesn't want to be this. I mean, he would like to be human again. But he is most comfortable this way. This is... So we're seeing an even further fusion. The animals are now us. We are now animals in a very broad sense, right? It's also, this whole idea is also remarkable for the fact that Miyazaki has stated that out of all of his characters, he feels that Porco is the closest to him. You know, Porco is basically, I mean, he's not Hayao Miyazaki, but of all his characters, Porco is closest to Hayao Miyazaki personality, yes? It's pretty funny that, um, like, you have that scene where Fio's natural innocence sort of breaks through that system. And that's the thing, is that um, quite deliberately, we don't know if Porco is changed. Because we don't know if he is supposed to be a pig. Because notably, Porco doesn't technically redeem himself in his attitude and personality. Right? He doesn't suddenly become a great guy at the end. He beats the, 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 the villain, but we don't see this ma major change in personality. So we have this, this question. Right, of what does that mean? Does he deserve to not be a pig anymore? Really interesting. Um, and you know, yeah, the animal's a hero, right? It's like, we very clearly have this strong message about how awesome animals are. Um, also, it's kind of funny that this is a almost exact inversion of Animal Treasure Island. You know, um, animal hero, everyone else is a, is a human. Human heroes, everyone else is an animal. Kind of interesting. Um, okay, this is okay. We're gonna spend some time here. Um, this is a film, ladies and gentlemen, and there's a, uh, quite a bit to unpack. So we're going to start with kind of um, some of the origins. Princess Mononoke is literally word of God set in the Muromachi period of Japanese history. Um, this is an actual historical period in which it is set. Um, further, Ashitaka is meant to be a member of the Imishi people. These are one of the original uh, tribes of uh, people who lived in Japan before the ethnically Japanese people that we know as Japanese today arrived and were pushed out. So in other words, Ashitaka is a foreigner in Japan. Ashitaka is not Japanese. Okay? Um, if you heard of the Ainu, Imishi are um, connected to the Ainu, it's actually a big complicated thing right now as to do the Imishi come first, do the Ainu come first, how are they related, all that kind of stuff. But, um, so the Imishi are these, these known things, and this presented Miyazaki with a problem. He knew Ashitaka, plot-wise, had to be on a mount so he could travel quickly from one faction to the other. But as soon as he put Ashitaka up on a horse, this is what his audience would think. Right? A Japanese audience sees a guy with a bow and a sword on a horse, and they think samurai, which would make him feel familiar, make him feel Japanese. And that is why Yakul is an elk. Mizaki has stated this. He wanted Ashitaka to feel foreign, to feel other. And so we put him on an elk just to add to that otherness. So what does Yakul represent? Is Yakul basically Gigi, right? Animal companion. Not quite. Because Ashitaka and Yakul never lose their connection. Even when Yakul is given an opportunity to leave, Yakul does not. Yakul always stays by Ashitaka's side. So what does this mean? It means a couple of different things, I think. You could just see it as simply, you know, it is about domestication. It is about animals that live with humans. Yakul probably, you know, was born in that tribe and lived his entire life in that tribe, doesn't know anything else. Yakul doesn't want to live 
apart from humans. That's all he knows, right? And so this could be this idea of, okay, this is one way in which we deal with animals. And if this were Miyazaki of 10 years ago, I think it would be ex exactly you know, simply that. But we see a shift here. Because I think you can also see this as an example of ideal symbiosis. These two work far better together than they do alone. Neither Ashitaka nor Yakul would have gone 10 minutes in that movie solo. But together, right, they do really, really well. And so it's this idea that if you treat animals well, you can work with them, right? So what are the other creatures in Princess Mononoke? Um, the Great Spirit of the Forest. Where did that come from? Well, it turns out um, there is an old painting called the Casa Gandir Mandala, which represents and, and shows this creature called the Yatsuka Mitsuo Mitsuno. I had to practice that. Um, which is a, a giant elk with a tree growing out of its back that was known to represent basically this uh, protector of nature deity. Um, and that was clearly the inspiration for the Great Spirit of the Forest. Um, but um, in addition, there is this yokai named Dadara Bochi, which is basically a giant uh, creature that only comes out at night and is so big it can like move mountains around. It's very, very big and very scary. Um, and so it's very clear that you know, those two things got plumbed together to make the, this idea of the Great Spirit of the Forest and kind of fuse these multiple folkloric um, um, influences. Uh, further, let's see if this sounds familiar at all. Um, once there was a hunter who went out and killed and, and hunted and killed a giant boar, but he did so in a very harsh, torturous way and um, you know, caused the boar great pain. So that when the giant boar died, it came back as a ghost and it haunted the hunter and killed the hunter. But this didn't actually resolve the fundamental problem of, the, of, uh, of its death. So the boar went out and traveled the land and attacked random travelers um, and, and you know, hurt and killed them. This is the story of Ines Asao um, in Japanese folklore and clearly the inspiration for the, the giant boar god at the beginning of Princess Mononoke. So you see now, Miyazaki is pulling on traditional Japanese stories and traditional Japanese folklore for his creatures. It's not, you know, Long John Silver is, I guess, a pig. You know, these are very deliberately pulled from folklore. Uh, even Moro is based on an Ainu god, um, a giant white wolf god of protection on the Ainu people. If you've seen Golden Kamui, um, uh, Ritar is a, a version of that deity. Um, and very clearly that, in, you know, in the Ainu tradition, this giant white wolf protects the forest. And so you're clearly pulling that in as well. Um, but here's where things get really interesting. Nobody is innocent. Nobody is blameless in Princess Mononoke. This new state where all the animals are cooperating is unnatural. I love this shot where the wolves are moving through all these mice, and the mice just move out of the way a little bit as these wolves are walking through. Note, canines eat mice, right? That is a prey species. But because suddenly we have this state, right, this, this strange situation, it has altered the balance of nature. Things aren't right. And again, Miyazaki of 10 or 20 years prior would have represented this as much more cleanly, as animals good, you know, humans bad, but no. The wolves are letting San do their work for them, right? They involved a human, which was thrown to them, but they have this human doing their work. Um, the giant boars are, starting, are, are insisting on this pointless war that everyone knows they will lose. The apes want to eat humans to gain their powers. Everybody thinks and does something wrong in Princess Mononoke. And suddenly we see this idea that, oh, it's not animals versus humans, right? It's perspective, it's viewpoint. It's the fact that you can be right, you can be wrong. You can be both simultaneously, right? Um, and just because you represent this, um, 
tradition, animals traditionally have this very straightforward way of seeing things. That isn't necessarily the best way of seeing things either. 